in chapter 5, verse number 16 and 17, I, I want to, I'm going to do sort of a, a bit of a, a wonky excursion this morning uh, for our Bible study. Uh, I want to look at these, these verses, verse 15 and 16, in, in sort of a, uh, an excursion kind of a way. Today I, I was looking at the records in the, uh, in, in the media room when we're getting the uh, media set up for today. Today is the 240th study in the book of Ephesians. Um, I remember years ago, back in the 60s, when I was just young, uh, there was a day when I was young, and uh, it was a very famous Bible teacher down in, in the southern, I lived in Mobile, Alabama, it was a very famous Bible teacher on the Gulf Coast, and he was going to teach the book of Ephesians. And I drove an hour across the, over to where he was to, to hear him teach in the first, the first class. And he taught the first two chapters of Ephesians in one 45-minute class. And I'm driving home, somebody, a guy I was with said, what do you think? I said, I think he don't know much about the book of Ephesians. If you can teach two chapters in one hour. Now, obviously, we haven't been doing that. But our pace through Ephesians has not been designed just to study each verse. We occasionally... More often than not, I take excursions off of the passages and study the doctrines that are in the passage and the rest of the scripture, and that's what I want to do this morning. We've already covered the text here, the context, and all those kind of things, but I want you to see something in the text and then look at some things in light of what he tells you here. Verse 16, redeeming the time, well, verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And that's a, that's a very clear statement. Alex read the passage in Proverbs 2 a while ago. Wisdom comes from God's Word, and you're to walk circumspectly. You're to walk paying attention, being alert to what's going on. Don't, don't be careless. Don't walk carelessly. And uh, as you walk, the, the way you walk alert and, and circumspectly, looking around and paying attention, is you don't walk like a fool. You don't, pay, you don't ignore the advice of God's Word. You don't go on your own human viewpoint. But you, uh, you, you, you walk in the wisdom that God's word gives you. Verse 17, it says, Wherefore be not, un, you, not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understanding what God's word is about, what God's will is about. You know, we call ourselves Shorewood Bible Church. Bible's our middle name. We still use Bible in our middle name because Bible's what we're about. We're here to study God's word because it's understanding God's Word and understanding how to, un, un, uh, how to study and understand God's Word for yourself. Not have to come here and have me tell you, but for me to help you learn how to study and go to the Word of God and get the information out for yourself to handle the situations that you live in. If, if that you become a perfected saint, a mature saint that can handle God's Word for yourself, understand what the will of God is, take the Word of God, the will of God, what He teaches you, and then go apply it in, the, in your life. You don't need me to teach you the application. You need me to teach you the doctrine so that you can then go and apply it. I don't know all the things you face. That's why psychobabble doesn't work. You know, you listen to preachers and they give you all this psychobabble and this stuff about this and that the next thing. And occasionally you hear one of them and say, well, that was really good because occasionally he hit on something that's about you. If you can train people, teach people, understand how to study God's Word, know where you are in the program of God, know where, where, what's going on, then you can go, like an adult, and make decisions for yourself and apply God's Word. And that's, that's, that's the goal. Well, in the passage here, the issue of redeeming the time, because the days are evil, that's how you walk circumspectly. And that's why he says, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. There's an urgency to that idea of redeeming the time. Go out here and buy it. When you redeem yourself, then you go out in the marketplace and you buy it so that you can take it out of the marketplace and then use it. So time, the, time, the days are evil. The world we live in is this present evil world. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. Everything about your life, everything about the world around you, outside what God's doing, is just, it's just vanity. It's like a, it just goes away. You reach for it and, it goes, and, and it's like a... Uh, a cloud. It doesn't have any substance to it. The substance of life, the source of life, real life, is in the life that God gives you. And walking, uh, redeeming the time means you, you go out here and you buy back, you, you, you purchase back, you, gra you grasp back the, the, the opportunities in life, and you do it with understanding that the time is fleeting. There's a vanity associated with time. It doesn't last. 
And you do it understanding what the will of the Lord is. In relationship to, the, to time that we live in, we're to stand in the truth of, God, of what God's Word is about. You need to know where. Come with me to Romans chapter 13. We've looked at these verses. I just remind you about them real quickly. Romans 13. When you think about redeeming the times uh, because the days are evil, start back in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This is why I don't use PowerPoint. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. There is a present time in which we live. That's called, it's called the dispensation of the grace of God. We live in a, in a time period in which God is doing something. You see, dispensational Bible study is about making distinctions between the different people in the Bible and the different times in which God operates and the different messages that operate during those different time frames. Knowing, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time, so we live in the present, a time of present suffering. Verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now that's, you know, you read that and you say, Oh, boy, that's great news. <laughs> I walked in, we went to the post office this morning on the way here and as I was coming out, I had my hands full of, uh, of some things, and there was a gentleman opened the door, and he says, well, come on out, young man. Well, he looked like he's maybe 15 years older than me. So I said, well, coming from you, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> you know, if he'd been 25, I thought he was mocking me, but uh, okay. But the, the, there, there is a, there's an issue of you're going to get older, and if the Lord tarries, you're going to get old, you're going to get sick, you're going to hurt, and you're going to die. Woohoo! Isn't that good message? That's the truth, though. That's the reality of what life is about. I watched a commercial on the TV this week, and it was about how to take the wrinkles out of your skin. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I don't care about that. I, I used to have a friend that, that uh, she, she didn't have any wrinkles on her face. And she used to brag about it. And I used to think, yeah, if you, but if you lost 40 pounds, you probably would. <laughs> oh, that's be. See, there are, ways, there are ways to evaluate things, and then there are ways to evaluate things. And age makes you think about those things and that kind of stuff. But the fact is, the death rate still won a piece. And when those things happen to you, when you understand we live in a time period of of present suffering, it doesn't, it doesn't scare you, it doesn't affect you, it doesn't make you think God doesn't love you. The outward man perishes, you understand why. You see that in verse 22, he says, we travail in pain together until now. The present time has been extended longer. And it's not just the world, verse 23 says, and not only they, but we ourselves also. Don't think believers haven't been exempted from this because we live in a fallen creation. We live, and we live there in a dispensation where God is extending grace one more day. He has to put off the removal of that in the kingdom another day. It isn't a matter that God doesn't love you. It isn't a matter that God doesn't have your best interest at heart. He does both of those. But when you understand where you are, then you can walk circumspectly. You can walk redeeming the times instead of complaining about the times. Come over to chapter 13. My point is you need to understand where you stand in the program of God. Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time. Okay? You're supposed to know the era that you live in. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. We just read that in Ephesians 4, verse, chapter 5, verse 14. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. It is high time that thou to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. There's not a lot of time left. There's only a limited time for us to live in, and we need to get busy using the time we have. That's what redeeming the time is about. Look at chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All through Paul's epistles... When he talks about 
looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the attitude that we're to have is we're looking, we have an anticipation and an expectation. The Bible uses the word hope. That is, we have this steadfast hope that, God, that the God of hope fills us with because we believe what he says. Looking for that blessed hope. Our, our attitude about life and about time is we're not, what, what we're, we're not looking for the government to help us and save us and solve all the problems. We're not looking for our own resources to do it. We're looking for Christ. And we understand that what, what's going on now is the forming of the body of Christ and there's a future that we have. And our, our hope, our anticipation, our expectation is that. And it's nearer than when we believed. It's at hand. That's the idea there. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 26. And again, in 1 Corinthians 7, he's talking about the issue of marriage. If you want to know about either what God says for you and me today about marriage, divorce, remarriage, it's all in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse number 26, I suppose, therefore. In other words, what he's doing is he's telling you how to make decisions about that. Okay, Now, in the midst of how to make decisions about your life, how to walk circumspectly in the details of your life, I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for man to be so. Notice, Paul understood that these, the sufferings of this present time, he calls them the present distress. Now, what the standard way of teaching that passage is, is to say, well, the Corinthians were going through persecution at the time, and therefore the instruction Paul gives, gives them here is about this per. But can you tell me a time in the dispensation of grace that isn't going to be the present suffering? 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says that in the latter time, some, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, that this... Versus perilous times. Now, you're, you're quoting it for me, and I, can't, and I can't do it. In the latter times, see, you can quote the verse, and all of a sudden, I'm, I can't do it. No, that's, that's goofy, isn't it? 2 Timothy 3, 1. You don't have to look at it. This know, there it is. This know also. I knew I was forgetting the part of it I needed to remember. This, you're supposed to know these things. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. Do perilous times sound like happy times? No, they're, they're times of distress, times of danger. The present distress is what the dispensation of grace is all about. Galatians 1, he says that Christ gave himself for us that he might deliver us from this evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. The whole of the dispensation of grace is identified as the evil world because it's the age of the official rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel rejected God the Father through the ministry of John the Baptist. They rejected God the Son, said, Away with him, crucify him, we'll have no king but Caesar. Then they rejected God the Holy Spirit in the ministry of the apostles and the little flock in the early Acts period. And there's the whole Godhead gone. Where do you turn when you don't have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? There's nowhere to turn. And just at the point when the wrath of God should have fallen, God interrupted that wrath, held it back, and administered the program of grace. And the dispensation of grace is the parenthesis that holds back the wrath of God, the wrath to come. It's this present time of the official rejection. Acts 4 says that the Gen Israel and the Gentiles join hands against the Messiah. And he's been rejected. And in the age of his official rejection, he's poured out grace. <laughs> but that's the, ad, that's the world we live in. That's the age we live in. It shouldn't surprise you when you go out on the street corner and people don't have, don't run into your arms open wide to hear, hear about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that is? The first thing about the gospel is Christ died for what? If you don't have sins, it's of no value. He came to the world to save sinners. And you know what mankind believes? You know what men believe? They don't believe they're sinners. They don't believe they're bad enough to die and go to hell. And you never get saved until you understand you are bad enough and you are going to go to hell. And you're not just going to go to hell, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire because of your sin. You say, well, I don't have a lot of bad sins. Well, the good sins can get you there too. That tree of knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve were taught, the good was, uh, human good was no more acceptable to God than human evil was. 
And what we do is we, we, we think, well, we'll do this. And people say, well, I'll do that. Religion is based upon the fact that you think you can do enough to get by the righteous judgment of, of the God of the universe, and you aren't. Amen. And that's offensive. It offended you one time. In fact, it a lot of times offends you even still. But that's, what it, that's where salvation starts. Nobody ever gets saved until they get lost, because why would you, how would you be saved if you weren't in danger? Well, anyway... So the present distress. But notice what he says in verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. So the present distress is what? It's short. It's limited. It's passing away. It isn't always going to be here. So if that's, when you go back to Ephesians now, the idea there is when you're redeeming the times because the days are evil, you're to walk in a way that recognizes the limited time, the urgency of getting on with it right now. Look with me at Titus chapter, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. That looking, anticipating, understanding that the time is short, that, that His coming is near, that's the, that's the next thing that's going to happen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What's going to make you zealous of good works? Looking for that blessed hope makes you not just redeemed, but you understand why he redeemed you, why he purified you unto himself so that you could have a zeal for good works. Listen, the great motivation to action and action now, you know, if you go to try to buy something, when people are selling you things at the close of the presentation, they have what they call an action step. <laughs> Your salespeople know that. You know it. If you get, they want to move you to take action. Don't just think it's a good product, but sign on the dotted line and pay the bill. Buy it. Buy the thing. And they have all kind of closings that are called action steps. Every time I pay a bill, you know, when you pay the bill, they say, write the amount on the, on the, the, the thing. You know how they do that? That's an action step. Motivate you to do it. The motivation for the Christian life, the supreme issue of get busy now, is that there aren't going to be a lot of nows left. So the idea of the Lord looking for that blessed hope, is, it's a great motivator to current action. We call the blessed hope, we term that the pre-tribulation rapture. Now the reason we say pre-tribulation rapture, and the reason we talk about it being important, is because there are some options. Now, I'm going to get a little wonky with you here, but it's okay. You need to, know, you need to understand this. Because this is all, all the stuff you hear out there, you need to understand these terms. A lot of this, these terms you need to understand because they're not necessarily Bible terms. And when you are, are taking terms that aren't in the Scripture and talking about them, you need to understand what they mean. When you talk about the rapture, talk about the Lord's coming, the term rapture isn't even in the Bible. But you, you know we're talking about how, how Christ comes back and takes the, the body of Christ to be, to be with Him that event, there are three different positions about when the timing of the rapture. And these options are, are, are pretty clear. If you, if you take a timeline, and that's what studying the Bible dispensationally is, is really about, you have the Lord's ministry back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross, is resurrected, he ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes here as the book of Acts begins. Then there comes a point in the book of Acts where the dispensation of grace begins, where we are today. Through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And you have the church, the body of Christ in here, in the dispensation of the grace of God. Now what this does is this is the, the mystery that's revealed through Paul about the body of Christ. That dispensation where we are now is going to come to an end. It's concluded by an event that we call the rapture. That is, the Lord comes out of heaven 
the dead in Christ are raised, the alive are caught up, and we meet the Lord in the air, and then we go to be with the Lord in the heavenly places. After that is a period of time that's called the wrath to come. We call that sometime the tribulation. This period of time here, and by the way, when it talks about, when, when, when we call that the tribulation, we don't mean just general trouble. Okay? You and I, trouble, difficulty, tribulation, trials, or tribulation is the idea of trials, are common to man. Okay? Everybody has them. This is talking about the end time tribulation, the end time troubles. Jesus says back here in Matthew chapter 24 that there's going to come a time of great tribulation like never was before. Those are the things that the prophets talk about. So when we talk about tribulation, Paul talks about tribulation back here, but it's a different, it's just trouble. This is officially the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30. So we're talking about this wrath to come. In that wrath to come is when the Antichrist shows up. That's that 70th week of Daniel chapter 9. At the end of that, you have the second advent of Christ back to the earth to set up his kingdom. So you have a pre-tribulation rapture that ends a dispensation of grace. Then you have the wrath to come out here in the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble in here, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's concluded by the second advent of Christ, the battle of Armageddon, those kind of things. Okay. Now, there are other views one is that the rapture doesn't take place until over here and that there's only one second coming. And that instead of the rapture being before the seventh week of Daniel, it's either in the middle of it or at the end of it. Now it's important that you understand the difference between them because there's a very basic problem, a danger if you put the rapture into this time period here. The pre-tribulation rapture, what did he say you're looking for? Looking for what? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, who? So if, you're, if, if the rapture is pre-trib, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior. So if you are in here in the dispensation of grace and you're looking for the Lord's coming, what are you, what, what are you, what are you looking for? You're looking for Christ. You're looking for Him. You have a dramatic event that's going to take place right here that's going to conclude the... There'll be no question about whether the dispensation of grace is over with because, boom, you're there. I mean, when the dead in Christ rise first and you're changed, <laughs> think about that. You're going to be walking along one day, and if you're still alive, it's going to be, boom. I mean, I think about that. Some of you are going to be walking along going, Others are going to be going, you're there. Now, I don't, you know, I don't care about what you do about that stuff. I'm just telling you, the reality is, wherever you are, whatever you're, you see how that would affect where you go, what you do? Because you don't know when that's going to happen. What am I expecting? That's what I'm looking for. But if the pre-tribulation rapture is not correct, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for this guy to show up. You're looking for tribulation. You're looking for the Antichrist. And you're not looking for Christ till over here. So if the pre-tribulation... right Look, when you're looking for Christ... That's because the rapture is going to be pre trib It's the next thing. But instead of, if, you, if you're really, 
If you take a post mid trib or post trib position, you're really looking for the Antichrist, not the Lord Jesus Christ. You follow that? That's why it's important to get the doctrine of this stuff straight. Because the posties are looking to go through the tribulation, to have the Antichrist revealed, and then to have Christ return at the end. Now you remember he says in 1 Thessalonians, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Is it a great comfort to you to know that you're supposed to be looking for that guy? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There, is, there are two primary proof texts that people use to teach a post-trib rapture, either mid-trib or post-trib rapture. If you teach one, you can teach the other. One is Matthew 24, and the other is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians 2. We look at Matthew 24 also. But I want you to be equipped to read these passages and understand when someone comes along and tries to tell you, these passages tell you that the rapture won't take place until the end of the, second, end of the, end of the seventh week, end of the wrath to come, that that's not what these passages are telling you. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled. You see what's going to happen if you think the rapture is over here? It doesn't say you're going to be comforted. It says you're going to be what? Troubled. It doesn't say you're going to be stabilized. It says you're going to be shaken in mind. Because believing and thinking that you're going to go through this time period of trouble, that you're going to have to face the Antichrist, and all those, that, that, this time of, of difficulty and, 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 and persecution out there is going to be what happens to you. And that's, listen, that's why the people that teach this stuff are all in the prepper stuff. And it's very popular today, even among some grace people, to abandon the pre-trib rapture and to go out into the, to, to the, the post-trib stuff. But when you do that, you better be a prepper because that's what you're looking for and prepper, prep, preparing for. And listen, I've never met any preppers that weren't shaken and troubled. Unless it's the people selling you the stuff and then they're, <laughs> they're doing okay. Notice in verse 1. Now we, and you need to go down through the passage. Just read it for what it says. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See that next word? And by our gathering together unto him. There are two things in that verse. He doesn't say by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our gathering together unto him. He says, I'm beseeching you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Those are two things. The first, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, is this thing over here at the end of the tribulation. Our gathering together to him is this thing here at the end of the dispensation of grace. And they're not the same. Now, when he, and he, the context will tell you what they are. Would it be an idea for you to understand the two ways you understand a passage clearly? One is context, context, context and other is cross-references. Well, look, look back at chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, why would they be troubled? Chapter 2, verse 2. Somebody's told them they're going to wind up over here in this time of trouble. And what does it do? It troubles them. It shakes them in their mind. So he says, for you people who've been told that you're going to go through this, this, this Sabbath week over here, until then, what should you do? Rest with us. You know what you want when you're, when you're troubled? You want some peace of mind. So he says, you that are troubled, rest with us. Now notice when he says that, there's a comma. Don't miss that comma. Because missing that comma can be the difference in your understanding of putting the rapture here and putting it over there. 
when you read that comma, you stop and take a breath. How is it that you can rest? Look what's going to happen. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with, fire, well, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. There's the, there's the coming of the Lord in chapter 2, verse 1. When he talks about, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord, that's talking about, and he just, he just been talking to him about this coming right here. That coming is a reality. And when he comes, he'll be admired in all them that, that, uh, that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always that, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him according to the grace of our, our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord. That's obviously the second advent. Come down to chapter 2, verse 8. Talking about the Antichrist. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and destroy with the brightness of what? His coming. So in chapter 2, verse 1, when he says, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that coming is this thing right here. And, he says, by our gathering together unto him. Now, what's that? Well, that's obviously something different. Something in addition to the prophetic program. By the way, if you look in chapter 2, verse 3, no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. That's this seventh wicked Daniel over here. There's the Antichrist. This stuff has to happen. That coming can't, can't come until the Antichrist is revealed. So if you're looking for that coming, what do you have to look for first? The man of sin to be revealed, the son of perdition. So what you're looking for when you're looking for the coming of the Lord is you're looking for the prophetic coming, the prophetic program to be executed. When it talks about our gathering together unto him, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, there's a gathering, in the air to meet the Lord, caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Not on the earth, in the air. Our gathering together to him, that's, that's really probably the better title to use than to say rapture. Now the word rapture comes, it's, a, it's a, a word that comes out of 1 Thessalonians 4 when it says to be caught up. The Latin term there out of the, out of the old Latin Bible is a word that our English word rapture comes from. And I don't mind the word, I mean, when you, when, rapture means to be caught up with joy. What's going to be more exciting than that blessed hope? So it's a, it's a good word, it's just not a Bible word. Okay, We use a lot of words that aren't Bible words. We talk about the incarnation of Christ, that's not a Bible term. We talk about the Trinity, that's not a Bible term. We talk about all kinds of things like that that aren't technically Bible terms, but we know what we're referring to. Okay. Now, and it's, it, it's really better to use Bible terms, I understand that, but you know, the force of habit, I'm an old guy, and the force of habit just, it just keeps coming out, so I'll keep saying rapture, and you keep thinking, I'm gathering together into him, okay? <laughs> if you notice in verse, uh, by the way, if you notice verse, th verse uh, number two, that you be not soon shaken in mind or trouble, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see that term, day of Christ? That term, day of Christ, refers to the, to the two things in verse 1. The day of Christ includes his second advent in prophecy and the gathering together of the mystery program. Now, if you look at verse 3, 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except the come. And he describes what, the, what prophecy calls the day of the Lord. And it's so clear that he does that, that almost every new Bible changes verse 2 from day of Christ to day of the Lord. They do that because their Greek text changes it. And their Greek text changes it because they have no idea about how to study the Bible dispensationally. And people that don't study their Bible that way and apply it that way and would rather use a quick fix of changing your Bible than to study the thing doctrinally out like to change it. But the day of Christ is a special term. It includes the day of the Lord. When Paul talks about the term day of Christ, he calls it the day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, wouldn't that be the day of the Lord, Jesus Christ? You see the day of the Lord in that phrase? He calls it the day of the Lord Jesus. He calls it the day of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it's called the day of the Lord. The Lord there is Jehovah. Who is Jehovah? The Jehovah in the day of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Paul uses the term the day of Christ, it's because he's adding to prophecy the revelation of the mystery. Because Paul divides the second coming of Christ into two different events in order to rightly divide the word of truth. Here's a topic, the second coming of Christ. Paul divides it into the prophetic aspect and the mystery aspect. He divides it between prophecy and the prophesied coming, right there, and the mystery coming. If this program here was a secret and it's not a part of the prophetic program, wouldn't it need a Secret ending? You follow that? That's important to get. Now the post-trib people, their big complaint is that when you talk about the second coming of Christ, you have, there's only one coming. In other words, Christ is going to return and there's only one coming. That's like the same people tell you there's only one gospel in the Bible. Ever heard that? If you've got a half a brain in your head that, in, in, with, 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 with 15 functioning brain cells, you would know that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. What they mean to say, but don't know how to say, is that there's only one gospel today in the dispensation of grace. That's what Galatians 1 is saying. But look at here. You go back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before the cross, and they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom about that hope, about this coming kingdom over here, and they're preaching that gospel of the kingdom back over here and don't even know Jesus Christ is going to die and be resurrected. How can you preach that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again the third day for our justification? How can you preach that without, and, and not know that he's going to die and be resurrected? The answer is you can't. And yet the Bible says they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That gospel didn't have anything to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Your gospel is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's two messages. People say, no, there's just one gospel in the Bible. They're nuts. <laughs> They're, and I, I mean that respectfully, but I mean it truthfully. The idea that there's only one gospel in the Bible is just to be blind in one eye, can't see out of the other. Which means you don't want to see. The answer is not that there's not one gospel in the Bible. The answer is there's a whole bunch of gospels in the Bible. There's just one gospel today. And dispensationalism makes the distinctions between them. I'm trying to make everything the same. There's, there's one coming of Christ, but it's in two distinct parts. In fact, it's in more parts than that. There are many appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming of Christ is a whole complex of events, starting with the rapture, extending all the way through to the establishment of his kingdom over here. And to limit it to one, only one thing, is to deny the reality. Now, go back, hold, get 1 Thessalonians chapter, no, I'm sorry, you got 2 Thessalonians 2. Compare with me Matthew 24. Here, here's the proof text, and I want you to see this. Here's the text that people use to say, well, there's only one coming, and that the, the rapture 
takes place at the end over here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Matthew 24, verse number 31. Verse 30, verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So the context there is, here's the tribulation at the end of the 70th week. Immediately after the seventh week of Daniel. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall be turned and not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall be all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There is his coming. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of uh, winds from one end of heaven to the other. So here's the order. After the tribulation, post trip, Christ is going to come back and then he's going to have a gathering of his people. So you're going to have the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. Because he says there's going to be a gathering there. And that's the doctrine. That's how you get to a post-trib viewpoint, those two verses. This, verse 29, it's after the seven years. Verse 30, there's a second coming, is coming. Verse 31, there's the gathering. You notice in verse 31, there's the great sound of a trumpet. First Thessalonians got a, got a trump. He gathered together the elect. He sends his angels. There's clouds. And they say, well, see, that's First Thessalonians 4. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a, with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ rise first, we, which are alive. We're caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. So, got to be the same gathering, right? The similarities, listen to me, the similarities are general in nature. But it's always the differences that make the difference. You listening? It's not the similarities that make a difference. Think about that. It's the distinctions that make a difference. So think about the differences. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. By the way, I'll just tell you, we have a teaching series in, in the bookstore that I did when we went for, through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 some years ago in our Sunday night studies. It's about like 15 studies. And I'm not going to do 15 studies with you. <laughs> but, but this issue is important. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now here's, here's our gathering together to him. We say to you by the word of the Lord, as part of Paul's special revelation, that we which are alive and remain... Under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see that? Wherefore comfort one another with this. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's that coming over there, the prophesied coming, cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as to prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're going to escape that day of the Lord. See that? How are you going to do it? Verse 9, For the Lord hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, we might, uh, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You're going to escape that day of the Lord's wrath over there. You see that? Because the body of Christ hadn't been appointed to that period of time. Why? Because you're not a part of prophecy. Now go back with me and think about this. 
Do the people in Matthew 24 escape? Do they escape this tribulation or do they have to go through it? Do these people escape it or go through it? Is that a difference? Sort of? In Matthew 24, verse 31. Who is it that gathers people? He sends his angels and they gather. Do you see any angels gathering anybody in 1 Thessalonians 4? In fact, do you see any angels, plural, in 1 Thessalonians 4? What do you see? You see an archangel, Michael. Do you see Michael in, in, in Matthew 24 anywhere? Do you get the idea there's some things missing here? In 1 Thessalonians, the dead in Christ rise first and the living are changed. Do you see any resurrection of anybody in Matthew 24? No. In, in 1 Thessalonians, it takes place, 1 Corinthians says, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Matthew 24, 31, He shall send His angels from the sound of, with the sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds. From one, Do you think that takes place in an instant, or you think that takes a little time? It's not instantaneous. It's a process, and He describes it to you. Do you see any shout? Voice of the archangel? You see, the things in Thessalonians aren't in Matthew. And the things, the specifics, the distinctions. First Corinthians, he says, it's the last trump. He says, it's the trump of God. Matthew 24, 31, he shall send his angels with a great, with the sound of a great trumpet. Who's blowing the trumpet there? Well, the angels are. So just because you see a trump don't, doesn't mean it, it wants a trump of God, wants a trump of angels. That happens to be different. You see, it's the differences that make the difference. The order of events are different. What you've got in Matthew 24 is, pro, is the prophetic program. It's the regathering of Israel to go into that kingdom, and there's no secret involved in it. Come back with, hold on to Matthew 24 and come back to Ezekiel chapter 36. You can, we could spend the rest of the, of, of the week running verses in the Old Testament about the, re, about the gathering, the regathering of the nation Israel at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of the millennium. Ezekiel 36, verse number 24. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. God has promised to the nation Israel to gather them back. When he says he's going to gather the elect from the four, who is the elect in that passage? It's the nation Israel. When you, re, you, you go back and read Isaiah 45. Israel, mine, elect. That's his chosen nation. And he's going to regather them so that they can be established in that kingdom. So when you come to Matthew 24, it isn't surprising that you read a whole context that's Jewish. People go back to Matthew. Every time you, you find somebody putting the, the, the rapture over in here, they're going to go to Matthew chapter 24 and try to stick the church in there. But the context of Matthew 24 is prophecy. It's Israel. It's not the body of Christ. Matthew 24, 15. When you shall therefore see the abomination spoken of by Daniel and the prophet. That's the Antichrist. That's the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. So the prophecy in, in Matthew 24 that Christ gives back here is looking specifically at that time period there and that kingdom over there. No question about what it is. Stand in the holy place. That's Israel's temple that's rebuilt over here. This is all, all, all Israel's program. Verse number uh, 20, when he tells them to flee, verse, 19, verse 16, let them which are in where? If you're in Chicago, you don't have to worry about fleeing.
I mean, unless the verse doesn't mean what. Well, unless you've got some goofy preacher that's telling you that Jerusalem is your hometown and Judea, you know, that kind of stuff. Judea has never, in your, in, Jerusalem has never been in any map of Bible lands in Illinois or any state you live in. Jerusalem is in Jerusalem. It's the city of the great king. Judea is the state that Jerusalem is in. It's Israel. Verse number 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Were you worried about flying out on Saturday? But in Israel, in Israel's program, what do you do on the Sabbath day? You rest. You don't do, you don't take a flight. You can't take a, a Sabbath journey, won't get you out of town. Verse 14, the gospel they preach is the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 13, they got to endure to the end to be saved. What you're dealing with here is prophecy. And by the way, what, pro, what apostles tell you about that? Apostles that when Jesus ordained them in Matthew 10 said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Apostles that in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said to them, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see, this message back here is Israel's message. These are Israel's apostles about Israel's program. Who gave you this information about this gathering? I speak, I, I speak to you by the word of the Lord. This is part of Paul's special revelation. So this is given to you by a unique apostle. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ should rise first. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together in the clouds. And you know what? We go out of here to be with the Lord. That's why you don't pray today. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We're not praying the kingdom come. We're praying the body of Christ goes. It's a different deal. It's important to get the differences in this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Talking about the events that take place at our gathering together here. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, if it's a mystery, did anybody know it before it was revealed to Paul? No. This is part of the secret program revealed to Paul about the church, the body of Christ. We shall not all be all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Everybody's not going to die, but everybody's going to get a resurrection body. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. See how it happens. Verse 52 describes how, how the event. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, you're dead in the grave, must put on incorruption, got to be resurrected. This mortal, you're not dead yet, but you're subject to dying, must put on immortality. There's two classes of people, dead people, living people, physically dead, physically alive, and they're all going to be changed. That's exactly what he says, that dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Paul says those events are a mystery. That's part of the secret revelation about how this secret program is going to come to an end. They're different. The events are a, are, are a secret program, not part of the prophetic program, but they're a unique way to end the dispensation of grace. Now go back with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. All that to say to you, there are two th events in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. There's the coming of Christ, His second advent, back over here for Armageddon and the destruction of, of, of uh, uh, the satanic policy of evil against the nation Israel and His cause. There's the, our gathering together to Him prior to that because He has to get this program out of the way, the, the mystery program, in order to carry out the prophetic program. Now, verse number 2. 
that you be not, here's what he's beseeching them, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by, revel, by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You're not to be troubled, and you're not to be thinking that the day of Christ has already occurred, or is occurring. Neither of those things are to be said about the rapture. There's no place that Paul ever says anything about the rapture troubling anybody. Go back, I don't have time, the clock caught us, but 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, in fact, look at, look at 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 7. So that you come in behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that verse cause you to be troubled or cause you to be comforted? When Christ comes and you're gathered together to Him, you face the judgment seat of Christ, Paul, uh, Alex talking to you in the first hour about, and you go to be with Him, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be blameless. Isn't that a comfort? Does it comfort you today to know I'm accepted in the Beloved? Your sin will hound you. Your sin will condemn you. You talk to someone and they talk about being overtaken by their sin. Yeah. But the victory over sin is at the cross. And in Christ you've been, set, you've been made free from sin. And you've been made alive unto God. So what you need to focus on is not who you used to be, but who you are in Christ now. That doesn't trouble you. That takes you out of trouble, gives you comfort. Philippians chapter 1. Every time Paul, uh, by the way, stop in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You see in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8 how he called it the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So would the day of Christ include the day of the Lord? Well, he just called it the day of the Lord, Jesus Christ, so sure. Okay, but the aspect that we're part of, that we're a part of is the mystery aspect. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 14. And also ye have acknowledged us in part, and we rejoice even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. I just want you to see how he uses a different term there. Come with me to Philippians chapter 1. So he doesn't always use the same. Paul uses several different itinerations of the term because Paul is giving the full, final revelation of all that's involved in the term. You've got that final revelation that, prophet, that the mystery adds to the prophetic program. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident, of this very, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Does that trouble you? Does that, does that shake you in mind as though that were to show up right away? I mean, that day looks like something I'd be happy to have show up today. Amen. Not going to trouble me to have somebody tell me that's, that's right here. Chapter, verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So the day of Christ, this isn't something that scares me. This is something I rejoice in. That gives comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now come on back to Thessalonians because we've got we to gotta get through here. By the way, you're supposed to say the, the, the Lord's coming is at hand. Isn't that what Romans 13 verse 12 said? It's at hand. That's what we're supposed to say. Philippians 4 verse 5, he says, Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. To say the Lord's at hand shouldn't scare me, shouldn't trouble me, shouldn't <laughs> shake me up. It should comfort me. It should let me rest in the midst of difficulties. It should give comfort and stability and confidence. But, verse number three, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, and that's going to talk about what day? The prophetic coming. 
shall not come except there be a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed, who poseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. He describes to you the prophetic events in the day of the Lord. Now verse 5, remember you not that, I, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know, you know this because I told you. What do they know about the coming of the day of the Lord? Here's what you know. What withholdeth, now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. There's something that is holding back this thing here. Is holding it back. But is letting it. Now that word let can mean hinder or it can mean to allow to go. But when it means to allow to go, have you, how, what do you do when you let a bucket down into the well? You allow it to go, but aren't you also keeping it from going any faster than you want it to go? And that's the idea there. There's something that is hindering the operating of the satanic policy of evil that's to be manifest in the person of the Antichrist out here. The mystery of iniquity is the opposite of the mystery of godliness. God's manifest in the flesh here. Satan's going to have his program personified in the man of sin. We'll see it in a minute in the text. And there's something withholding it, and the Thessalonians know what it is because Paul told them. What did Paul tell them about? This thing here. You're going to see when we get down to verse 13 and 14 what he told them about, but what he told them about is this program right here is withholding that. Verse 7, verse 8. And then, when this program is taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed. There is, you see that wicked is capital W? That's the Antichrist. That's verse 2, when the son of, man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. reason he has two titles in, in, verse, in, in verse 2, verse 3, is because the first half of the week he's the man of sin, second half of the week he's the son of perdition. Then shall that wicked be revealed? What is going to happen to him? Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice the it's them. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should, that they should believe a lie, there, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those folks over there are going to have a problem. Verse 13, but we. See the contrast? It's the difference that makes the difference. But that's not us. But we. are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning. His purpose from the beginning of the dispensation of grace hath chosen you to salvation through belief of the truth and sanctification, through belief of the, uh, sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. That's not as the Calvinists say. That beginning is not back before the foundation of the world. That beginning in verse 13 is the beginning of the dispensation of grace. And the way you know that's verse 14. Whereunto? Whereunto what? From the beginning he called you to salvation. Whereunto he called you. How? By our gospel. Has Paul gospel, Paul's gospel always been preached? You see where you, where you kick yourself in the, in, in the shin when you think there's only one gospel in the Bible? Paul's gospel began to be preached at a particular point in time, right back over here. And from the time that gospel began to be preached, these folks that believed that had been called to salvation from that stuff over there. What have you been called by his gospel to? To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. God has not appointed us not called us, not chosen us to wrath, but to the obtaining of salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not justification. That's not your, your, your justification in eternal life. That's salvation in phase three into the glory. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. That's it. 
So you have the prophetic events, verse 3 and 4. You have the delay, the reason that the prophecy has been interrupted, verse 5, 6, and 7. Then you have a description of the week and people that are in that, the seventh week, verse 8 to 12. And then in verse 13 and following, it's we, not them, not they, it's we, the body of Christ. And what are we going to do? We're going to, we've been chosen to salvation from all that prophetic wrath. That's why it says in verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught by word, whether by word or by or our epistle. You know what you're to do? You're not to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. There were people then, there are people now who deny the right division of God's word, deny the distinction between prophecy and mystery, blend them together as though they were one, and would move you away from that hope that blessed hope of the gospel. And Paul said, you need to stand fast in that hope. Believe what I'm teaching you. Because verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. If you want to be comforted, if you want to be established, it'll be right here. It'll be in God's Word to you through Paul's epistles. It'll be God's Word rightly divided. And when you abandon that, you're going to be shaken in mind. You're going to be troubled. You're going to be tossed to and fro. And you won't be able to redeem the time in these evil days. You won't be able to walk worthy. You won't be able to walk circumspectly. But you can if you understand what the will of the Lord is, what God's doing. The question, listen, the question is, who are you looking for? Are you looking for the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you looking for the Antichrist? If you're looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're looking for a pre-trib rapture. If you're not looking at a pre-trib rapture, you're looking for the Antichrist. You're looking for the wrong Christ. You're looking for the one who's going to come and say he is Christ and he isn't. You know what you need to do? You need to focus on your Savior. And don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. And focusing on him means to focus on his word rightly divided. And to let that be the anchor of your soul. It does make a difference in a day of declension and change, it does make a difference if you're pre-trib. And all the people that, that, that go away from it, and listen, I don't care if you're listening to some whack job like Alex Jones on the radio and the TV, or if you're listening to some famous preacher, when they tell you that you're going to go through the tribulation, what they're telling you is that God's word rightly divided doesn't matter. And it does. Who are you really looking for? That's why it's important. That's why the pre-trib rapture matters. Because it lets you focus on the one you ought to be looking for and not on things that, that you aren't. Because if you're looking for the Antichrist, all you're looking for is to take care of, to keep what you got and get what you can't, hadn't got. And that doesn't get it. Now, by the way, if, you, if you've never trusted Christ today, we read the passage in Thessalonians. What happens if you miss the rapture? If you're unsaved today, the Lord came today and you, and you weren't saved, you're not gathered together with Him. You're going to be left right here. And you know what that passage says? It says God's going to send you a strong delusion. And because you, believe, because you desire to believe a lie, He'll give you a lie. The Bible is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. The attitude you come to it with is, it will determine what you get out of it. If you want God's Word to teach what you want it to teach, it'll teach you what you want it to teach. If you're willing to sit, stand before God's Word and say, Lord, you speak and I'll listen. You have that believing attitude, it'll make a difference then too. Jesus Christ died for your sins at Calvary. God commended His love towards you and that while you're yet a sinner, Christ died for you. It's the greatest message you'll ever hear. In the midst of your sin, the midst of your failure, God took it to Himself took the price, took the penalty, took it out of the way, 
and gives you his life. If you've never trusted him, he'll give it to you this morning just by trusting him that quickly. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to pray. If you had to do that much, you'd never know if you did it right. Just trust him. God will save you. You trust Jesus Christ to be the Savior he died for you to be. And those of you that are saved, listen, it doesn't get any different for you. As you've received him, so walk in him. You've got difficulties in life. You've got challenges in life. You've got failures in life. You've got heartaches in life. Hello. As long as you're in life, you're going to have all of that. And you know what the answer is? It's still the cross. Just run to Calvary and find your shelter there. Father, we thank you this morning for life in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that blessed hope that we can genuinely look for our Savior.